Hi everyone, this lesson is on restless legs syndrome. So we're gonna talk about the causes and conditions that are associated with restless leg syndrome. We're also gonna talk about some of the pathophysiology behind why this occurs. We're also gonna talk about the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So restless legs syndrome is also known as Willis-Eckbaum disease. And it is a chronic disorder involving recurrent episodes of an irresistible urge to move legs. So the epidemiology reveals that this is a common condition. It's estimated to affect between 5 to 15% of the general population. And there are certain patient populations that are at an even higher risk for this condition. And what we do note is that pregnant individuals, up to 29% of them will experience restless legs or restless legs syndrome. And then patients with end-stage kidney disease, up to 50% of those patients will experience this condition as well. And then there may be a genetic predisposition. So having family members that have this condition increases your risk for having it as well. And if the onset of this condition occurs early on in life, for instance, in children, it's more likely that that child has a family history of restless leg syndrome. So now let's talk about those risk factors and associated conditions. So the risk factors and conditions that are associated with restless leg syndrome include the following. Iron deficiency. So iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia are associated conditions that can lead to restless leg syndrome. Vitamin B12 deficiency is also another risk factor for experiencing restless legs and restless leg syndrome. Alcohol use is also another risk factor. We can see caffeine use being a risk factor as well. We mentioned this before, kidney disease, and especially end-stage renal disease, those patients are at a higher risk for having this condition or experiencing restless legs. Patients with diabetes are also at an increased risk. Pregnant patients, as we mentioned before, certain peripheral nerve conditions can also increase the risk for restless leg syndrome. Venous insufficiency, so if there's issues with venous drainage in the legs, this can also increase the likelihood of restless leg syndrome. Having celiac disease is also another associated condition, and having fibromyalgia is also another associated condition as well. And then we mentioned this before, family history is also another risk factor. And then there are some medications that can cause restless leg syndrome as well, and these include diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. The selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, are antidepressants that can also increase the risk of restless legs and restless leg syndrome. And then TCA antidepressants can also cause this condition as well. Now let's talk briefly about the pathophysiology behind this condition. The pathophysiology behind restless leg syndrome appears related to changes in iron and dopamine activity in the brain. So if we were to look at this image here of the brain, it's a very complicated image. We don't really need to know all of these different parts of the brain and these pathways, but I want to focus on two areas here, the thalamus and the substantia nigra. These two areas are involved in muscle movement. So dopamine excess within these areas, within the substantia nigra and the thalamic areas of the brain, appears to be related to restless leg syndrome. And then also in the same areas, if cells in those areas have decreased iron, or if there's decreased iron in those areas in general, this seems to also be related to the onset of symptoms of restless leg syndrome. And then with regards to patients who have end-stage renal disease, it is uremia, or an increased urea in the blood, that appears to be the cause of restless leg syndrome in those patients. So now let's talk about the signs and symptoms. So by far the most important symptom of this condition is a strong sensation or feeling of need to move the legs. So there's restlessness of the legs. The arms may be affected in some cases, and it is described as an unpleasant and uncomfortable sensation. This sensation improves with movement. So there's a feeling or an urge to move the legs, it's uncomfortable, it's unpleasant, but when that patient actually moves their legs, there's a temporary relief of that uncomfortable sensation. And then what happens is there is a worsening of this feeling or sensation when the patient begins to rest their legs or during rest. And in addition to improvement of the sensation with movement, this sensation may also be relieved by rubbing the limbs or rubbing the legs. What's classic with restless leg syndrome is that these symptoms are more likely to occur in the evening and at night, and they often occur within 15 to 30 minutes of laying in bed. Now, there are some cases that are severe enough that these symptoms can occur throughout the day. Again, most of them are going to occur in the evening and at night. So because of this, they're more likely to have sleep disturbances. So sleep disturbances are very common. You can imagine that if you're trying to lay down and you're continuously feeling like you have to move your legs, you're not going to be able to sleep. So this can cause insomnia. And fatigue 
is common with these patients. And this is associated with another condition we call periodic limb movement during sleep or PLMS. And this is a condition where there is involuntary jerking movements during sleep. So they fall asleep, but their limbs jerk in an involuntary fashion. And 80% of restless leg syndrome patients are affected with this condition. So it is a highly associated condition with restless leg syndrome. So now let's talk about the diagnosis and treatment. The diagnosis of this condition is based on DSM-5 criteria, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Now the DSM-5 criteria notes that the urge to move legs requires that one, it occurs with rest, two, it is improved with movement, and three, it is worse in the evening or at night. So those are the symptoms we just talked about. Now the DSM-5 criteria has a particular time frame that needs to be met for these particular symptoms. So these symptoms must occur three or more times per week for at least three months. This is the required time frame according to the DSM-5 criteria. Now there are other diagnostic criteria that do not have time requirements. We're going to talk about those as well here in a moment. And another important aspect of the DSM-5 criteria is that the symptoms cause significant distress and impairment. And then another criteria in the DSM-5 is that the symptoms are not caused by another condition or medication. And and you might remember that we talked about certain medications that can cause restless leg syndrome, but if it is deemed that one of those medications is causing the symptoms, then it would not be considered restless leg syndrome. But there's another diagnostic criteria, which I note here, the IRLSSG, which is the International RLS or Restless Leg Syndrome Study Group. And they have another type of criteria that does not have the time requirement and does not have this exclusionary criteria. So according to that criteria, even if it's deemed to be caused by a medication, that doesn't matter. It's still considered restless leg syndrome. And then, as I mentioned before, that time requirement is not required. So you might have less frequent episodes for a shorter period of time, but that would also be considered restless leg syndrome. So those are two criteria that can be used in order to diagnose restless leg syndrome. So this is the DSM-5 criteria. But if you want to use the International Restless Leg Syndrome Study Group criteria, then this time requirement and then this exclusionary criteria are removed. So that's basically the difference between those two criteria. Now let's talk about the treatment of this condition. It depends on the underlying cause. We talked about many causes before, including iron deficiency, vitamin B12 deficiency, and some other causes as well. So if the underlying cause is identified, it's important to treat that underlying cause. Vitamin B12 and iron supplementation may be useful. So we talked before that deficiencies of iron and vitamin B12 can cause restless leg syndrome. Now some other treatments include dopamine agonists. So dopamine agonists are first-line therapies. So premipexol is one example. Clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine, can also be used as well. Although tachyphylaxis can occur with prolonged use. Tachyphylaxis is where the effect of the medication wears off over time. And then gabapentin may be used in moderate to severe cases. So a lot of times it's going to be important to identify and treat the underlying cause. And then some of these other treatments can be used as well. So if you want to learn more about other neurological conditions, please check out my neurology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thank you so much for watching and hope to see you next time.